Boston, thanks so much for uh, having us. Really appreciate it during this uh, crazy uh, time that we're in. But we're hoping that you find these programs informative and exciting. So um, if you're watching live, you can unmute and ask questions or you can type questions in and Chris will uh, uh, shout them over to me and I'll answer them here live. If you are watching this program after it's been recorded, then uh, feel free to just email questions and Chris will compile the questions and then uh, myself and the staff will go through them all together and we'll answer all your questions. It might take us you know, a day to get them all answered, but we'll absolutely get it done for you. Um, so today we're going to talk about Africa. We're going to touch on some conservation uh, things at each program. And depending on the, how the questions come in and what people's interests are will be kind of the direction that we will flow in. But I want to take the opportunity to, to share some personal experiences and, um, and show you some of the exhibits that we have right here where we're filming and give a different perspective uh, that, you can't, uh, that you can't learn on the internet. You can't Google uh, why uh, certain animals are kept certain ways and things like that. So I thought we would touch on that a little bit. Um, Drew, what do we have up first? So Drew is um, helping out today. He's one of our managers. And we're just gonna start off with some, a couple of small things here and we come closer to the camera. This is an African uh, side neck turtle or they call them African mud turtles. And they're found uh, throughout many regions of Africa in usually slower moving uh, bodies of water. Um, they don't do real well in fast moving rivers and things, but you could find them up closer to the uh, embankment more in uh, slow moving and still water. And they call them side neck turtles, because let me just show you here. Uh, his neck is actually sideways uh, in the shell. So when they get uh, scared or just, you know, doesn't feel like doing anything, he puts his head and we just try to get that. See, it's sideways inside the shell. And they're called, uh, also referred to as mud turtles. And mud turtles, uh, most of them will have what they call um, a uh, hinge plastron. Plastron. So the bottom is the plastron and the top is the carapace. And if you see right here, this is hinged. So he can close up in his shell. Now this time of year uh, with what's going on, a lot of people are requesting information on pets, what's a good pet, what's easy to care for. This is a pretty easy uh, turtle to care for and pretty interesting because it has a side neck. So when they're out and they're swimming around, the, the neck goes sideways to catch fish and things like that. Uh, fairly low maintenance. Um, uh, you do have to have a water system, so you have to have clean filters and things like that, but a uh, pretty uh, different turtle than you normally see. It's not a typical redhead slider or some of the more common. Uh, turtles and sometimes they're available in the pet trade and uh, sometimes they are not. Probably the one downside to these is most of the ones that you would uh, find would be uh, wild caught. So you have to you know see what the numbers are. As far as we know, the numbers of these are really well and some of that money does trickle into the African economy. We are gonna get into that a little bit today and see if people are interested in that. That's a subject I know uh, quite a bit about because I have, um, you know, many friends in all different parts of Africa that I'm pretty close with, so I get some pretty good information. But we're gonna put this little guy back. So that is a, mostly a water turtle. And then Drew, can we get a bigger turtle or tortoise? Now there's a lot of debate. I've seen people get into full-blown arguments over, that's a turtle, no, that's a tortoise. Scientifically, if you're taking biology, zoology classes and you get this question, uh, which I had many years ago, you know, and the way it was put to me is I think I had like 45 minutes and as many pages as I needed to explain all the scientific differences between turtles and tortoises. So that the teacher of that class had a great sense of humor and that was a trick question um, because, which I actually got right. Um, I think that class was a very small class, a specialty class that I used to take 21 people. And I think I was the only one that got that right. Um, so. Uh, there is, scientifically, all shelled reptiles are classified as turtles, right? So the correct answer would be all shelled reptiles are classified as turtles. In different parts of the world, they refer to them as tortoises, turtles, terrapins, and they have several other different names. Here in North America, the way we do it is if it lives on the land and has a back foot that's shaped like an elephant, then we typically refer to that as tortoise. Uh, not all land... Um, the turtles will be called tortoises in North America because the box turtle, the eastern box turtle that we have, um, and there are several other box turtle species in North America, uh, their back foot is shaped more like a hand, so they, they'd be more like this shape when they walk, not the elephant shape. 
And then in different parts of the world, they, um, South and Central America, sometimes they'll use one particular word for all turtles and tortoises. And I have friends in Australia that sometimes call sea turtles tortoises. So it's, you know, but the correct answer is all shelled reptiles should be cl are classified as turtles. We do call this an African spur thigh tortoise though. Um, just to confuse everybody. And these guys are, are live in the African savannas. It's a, it's a nice uh, a turtle, a tortoise. They can grow. This is a smaller female. And this one here was actually born in 1997, Anna. And she can still grow bigger right now. She's about 35 pounds. They can grow up to be about 60 pounds if they're girls and about 20 inches long. Um, the males can grow over two feet long and weigh over 200 pounds. We have a big one um, in one of our buildings here, Tank, and he's about 130 to 140 pounds. So we couldn't really lift him. So we went with this one. It's a little easier to carry. If you, as far as a pet goes, most of the time uh, in New England, these outgrow their, their um, pet owners because you have to bring them in. Ours are all inside right now. We have a bunch of these that used to be people's pets. Um, and you have to find indoor quarters for them in the cold weather, then they, they can go outside in the nice weather. Uh, sometimes the turtles and tortoises are hunted for, uh, for meat and uh, other purposes, uh, but their numbers right now are very good in Africa and they're not being uh, over hunted. Of course, wildfires and things like that would affect this species uh, a lot because they live in the ground and they actually make tunnels and burrows underground some of them can be as much as 10 feet deep and uh, over 20 feet long. So pretty elaborate uh, tunnels and burrows, which other animals will also use for their, for their homes. So pretty uh, cool turtle or tortoise. And these are herbivores. Um, so they just eat vegetation. Okay. What do we have next on the agenda, Drew? Is it a snake, a frog? Frog. Can I get some paper towels with that frog? This frog requires a lot of paper towels. Let me grab him there. Okay. Sorry. This here is uh, Pickle. He is one of my favorite animals here at Animal Adventures. And he is an African pixie bullfrog. And you see he has dirt on him. That's the substrate that he lives in. Uh, this is a really amazing uh, animal. These guys are also found in the African uh, savannas. And, um, a lot of people are probably aware of that it doesn't rain for about half the year, not what we call significant rain, you know, showers and things like that, sure, but not significant rain um, for about half the year. And during that time, these frogs will uh, burrow underground about two feet. Um, and they actually, their skin cells around them technically uh, die and form this like a uh, cocoon, like a saran wrap around the frog to hold the moisture in. And then I know this one looks, uh, like it's overweight, but this is how they're made to be. So the African pixie bullfrog is more of a round, uh, chubby type frog. Uh, it's the second largest uh, frog in the world. The largest is the Goliath bullfrog from Africa, which is designed to be, you know, a very long and, and, a, and a big, a good jumper. This one here is not, jumping is not its thing. Uh, eating is its thing. That's very good at that. And uh, they can weigh, anywhere from one and a half uh, pounds to over four pounds. The females are smaller than the males. Um, this one here is a male and the females get, you know, maybe half this size. Um, the, the, one of the cool things about these guys is when they're underground and locked in, they burn very little calories. They just live off of this fat. And then when the rains come uh, so strong and penetrate the ground, they'll wake up out of their uh, mini hibernation, we'll call it. And then they tear open that skin. And even though it's technically dead, it still holds a nutritional value and it'll eat that skin and then come up out of the ground. And being this large, uh, they can swallow almost anything they want. Anything that is pretty much the size of their body this way across, they can swallow. So if he, uh, if a little uh, rodent runs by or a small snake, I've seen videos of uh, birds, um, you know, on the ground that they've, they've eaten. Now, of course, they can't chase things down. So they just sit still and there'd be what we call an ambush predator. So an animal comes by and they kind of just lunge forward and swallow them whole. The way they grab is technically we're not supposed to call them teeth, but they are uh, bona fide uh, uh, calcified ridges uh, that uh, stick out in the front. They look just like teeth when they bite. They feel like teeth. Um, but technically, they're not supposed to be called. Oh, 
but when they bite you, you call them teeth, right? Uh, then that will hold on to their prey and then they use their front legs and kind of help push the food down and swallow the food down into their belly. So really a neat little frog. Uh, someone just gave me a little uh, froglet. Uh, they start off, I have one now that's literally the size of my thumbnail. So like that tiny and then they grow into uh, these and, and even bigger than this. This one can grow bigger. She's, he's not done yet. And they can live uh, 15 plus years. This guy here is only about three or four years old. And uh, like I say, will still grow a bit. As far as conservation for these, uh, they are uh, frog legs and frog are eaten by many different cultures all over the world. And this one is no exception. So people do uh, eat their, their frog legs, but their numbers, because frogs can have hundreds and even thousands of uh, you know, babies in a season, then uh, their numbers are, are very well. So they're doing, they're doing good. And these are very easily and readily bred in captivity as well. So everybody needs at least one of these, right? All right, put him back. What do we have next? Send you a little snake next. This snake is interesting because it's in a shed. So we'll be able to show people what it looks like when it's uh, shedding. And then um, this snake is, in a, what we call a little bit of a dry shed. And, um, and we'll be able to show you and tell you what we're gonna do with that. So this is a, a ball python, usually they're darker. This one, there's so many, if you uh, follow snakes at all, ball pythons are one of the hot snakes that people, not hot as in venomous, hot as in very popular snakes that people breed all different uh, colors and morphs and, uh, Ball pythons have sold, uh, I personally know people that have paid uh, $50,000 for a ball python. Um, you know, seems crazy, but I guess if that's what you're into, right? Uh, the ball pythons typically are darker and uh, they're also found in the African savannas and have a, a wider range than that. They're not big on tree climbing, though they can climb trees. Um, and also uh, they'll spend a lot of time on the ground and under the ground, so these guys will go underneath the ground into little holes and burrows. Now, snakes stick out their tongue to smell. They have uh, no eyelids. So you see how his skin is wrinkly? He's going into a shed. And after this program is over, this one will go into a, a box with warm water and it'll help him crawl out of this shed because this is what we call kind of a dry shed. A very healthy snake. You can see how fast the tongue is flicking out. Um, one neat thing that was uh, studied with ball pythons in relevance to, uh, in relation to elephants, is that ball pythons would be on the ground, and there's a study done, I'm really bad with time, it was probably 20 years ago, and what they noticed is when elephant herds were moving, ball pythons uh, would take their chin, and they'd press their chin on the ground, feeling the vibration from the ground, and then, uh, even though snakes are not considered intelligent, there are records of ball pythons uh, pressing their chin to the ground and then actually going into holes and, and burrows and stuff which would prevent them from getting uh, stepped on. They're usually pretty docile snakes that only grow, um, you know, six feet would be considered very big for a ball python. Typically they stay around three or four feet. Um, you know, the biggest one I've ever seen I think was probably five feet, but most people say they can grow up to six feet. I just haven't seen that. So pretty, pretty cool uh, little snake. They are hunted for meat. Uh, skin uh, to a lesser, de lesser degree. Not too many people um, use smaller snakes when it comes to uh, leather products and stuff. They go for big snakes, you know, like pythons and things. So get a good view of that. There you go. Pretty neat snake. All right, we should go to something furry, huh? What do we have next, Drew? Sure, we have a leash and everything. I'll get some marshmallows. So. Next, we're going to do an African bush baby, and uh, we're going to do two primates today, both considered uh, prosimians or lesser primates. Um, sorry, I have to have a little hot tea. I have a tickle in my throat. It helps me uh, speak clear, clearer. So Drew's going to grab our little friend Gideon. And of course, his normal diet is not marshmallows, but as he gets, as he works, he gets little treats. Thanks, Drew. And Gideon is really cool. He's about 10 years old now. He was born in captivity in North Carolina by a, a family that um, bred these four um, 
zoos and things. And then due to illness in their family, they got out of the business and he was the last baby born that needed a home. So we gave him a nice home here in Bolton where we live. And uh, the, the, this is a greater uh, Galago, a greater a bush baby. It's the larger kind. There are also very small ones that only weigh, uh, you know, in the ounces. This one here, this, the greater Galago weighs, uh, you know, uh, about three and a half, four pounds would probably be the maximum weight on them. Now uh, they live um, in the northern part of South Africa and also um, East Africa. They have a pretty good range. You can find these guys high in the trees, you know, up where the canopy would be, 100 feet plus in the air. You can also find them very low uh, to the ground. There are many different tales of how they got their name, Bush Baby. Uh, I get a couple more marshmallows. Uh, some of the tales um, are they, they sound like screaming babies, which they do. They have a lot of different vocalizations. Some for scared, I mean, they're scared. Some mean uh, that, you know, um, they're looking for a mate. Some, for, uh, they're lonely. He lived in our house for several years and if he didn't get constant attention, he'd send out this, hey, I'm lonely type call. And, um, you know, we have to sit with him and let him groom you and everything else. Uh, even though in the wild, mostly they're solitary animals. You can see them together, but they don't really travel in troops or families. Um, they come together for breeding purposes, um, but other than that, they're usually pretty solitary animals. There are always exceptions where there are small troops, you know, reported living together. Um, other stories I've heard uh, right out of Africa are that um, there were tribes that would see bush babies low in the bushes and see their eyes glowing and thought that they were, you know, being attacked by pygmy tribes and things like that and uh, would call them bush babies. So there's a lot of different uh, tales that go on out there. I've talked to my friends in Africa and they've heard them all and no one seems to know the originator of them. Like a lot of things that you hear, who knows where they got started, but they do have these loud shrill like calls that do sound like screaming uh, babies. Um, and they're pretty neat. They can jump about 18 feet. I know they can jump 18 feet from branch to branch. Um, when he lived here in our house, he would jump from the back of our sofa onto our bread rack because he was obsessed with eating bread. And I measured it and it was 18 feet. And he did that regularly. And that's about as far as I've seen them uh, jump. So this guy here is called a, a lesser uh, primate. So they're considered not as intelligent as you know the, the new world monkeys uh, and apes. So I think they're, they're very, very smart. And, those things could be reconsidered. Um, most primates in Africa are hunted uh, by locals for their meat. These guys are no exception. So this is an animal that would be hunted um, for their meat. And that's not going, local people eating the animals for survival is not going to have a major negative impact because um, they're going to repopulate faster than people are hunting them. What does have a major negative impact is uh, poaching. So poaching is a real uh, issue. It is very al uh, alive and strong today. And um, poaching for the pet trade is uh, less in, in places like the United States because these animals are readily bred in captivity, but they are still poached for uh, the pet trade and the illegal pet trade and also for, uh, for meat. Um, so that is a concern that we have. There are things that we can do to help poaching. Uh, one of the largest poachers, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I have friends that are Chinese, so don't take this wrong, but the Chinese culture in the past, um, up until 2017, was the largest legal importer of ivory, so elephants and rhinos and things uh, in the world. And they signed a pact um, to stop doing that. And then recently have again started, um, they can use tiger bone and um, rhino, rhinoceros um, in, uh, the medicinal research and things. And they're supposed to be farming them and using them, but um, people that I know in the conservation field say there's no way to tell what, is, what animals they're killing are actually born on the farm like they're supposed to and which ones are coming in illegally. So it's really hard to track. Um, and probably um, just talking to medical doctors around the world, there is nothing in a rhino horn or tiger bone that is magical that is going to heal anything. So um, there's just a lot of money behind that industry. Um, and then when they made the ivory trade illegal, um, the illegal ivory trade um, and poaching of animals in China and other places, um, you know, was still very significant and is, is still very significant today. So um, there are things we can do in, in, 
to help that. Um, there is hunting, which um, trophy hunting, there are two different perspectives on trophy hunting. Um, and one is that trophy hunting uh, is good because it brings money into the economy. And when you trophy hunt in Africa, you, the people that run these organized hunts, they own the, they own the land. So they can keep uh, poachers and stuff off and then only let people hunt so many elephants or uh, right now lions are a big thing. And the lion numbers actually are lower than the elephant numbers uh, in Africa, which a lot of people aren't really aware of, but that, that's actually true. And so when people trophy hunt there, the trophy hunters, the people that organize that there, the way they defend it and what they say is great is that um, they own the land and they keep poachers off the land and then they repopulate and they keep the numbers up that way. Uh, the opponents to that say that, um, you know, from an ec economic standpoint, that money doesn't really trickle down to the, to the right people, that, you know, billions of dollars do come in, but the um, African government is so corrupt that comes in and takes um, all the money from the people that actually uh, need it. I work with a group um, in Africa that is from the United States that d does uh, micro loans. And I'm really a big fan of this. And I won't spend too much time, but I know people are interested in uh, the economy and conservation over there. So I just want to touch on it. And in future programs, if you want to hear less about this, I'll, I'll talk less about it. But what, what happens is the average um, interest in Africa to get a loan is about 30%. So um, I work with a company. Um, out of Colorado that uh, has people in Africa and I have friends in Africa, in um, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, many different parts of Africa. And what they do is they uh, go over there and they do micro loans. They, they, their interest rate is 12%. And it still sounds high, but the group I work with makes no money off it. So what they do is they set up micro loans so people that are poor over there can start businesses. Uh, one woman was selling uh, shoes just locally on, you know, on the roads and stuff there that she was making uh, to support her family and through these microloans now has uh, shoe stores and malls and everything else and is, and is actually becoming very wealthy. So these microloans at 12%, the people can afford to get the loan and then that 12% goes to pay the people from the United States that stay and train people in Africa to stay there and help people understand the loan and start a business and support the business. The people that I know that do those in the United States are already multimillionaires and make zero money from it. It's just something they do as a service to help people in Africa. So I think microloans for my own self is easier to manage the money. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not a fan of, uh, trophy hunting and my own research. And again, I'm trying to keep an open mind to it because I, it's, when you're doing research, the hardest thing is to take your emotions out of the picture. And I'm, um, the thought of killing an elephant or a lion or something like that sickens me. Um, so I have to try to separate my emotions to facts. So I've read many articles as early as this morning, even reading a new article that was published. Um, you know, so, uh, there are a lot of people that are for trophy hunting. When I read the facts to take my emotions out of it, I still think it's, uh, you know, it, that eventually in the near future, it should be a thing of the past. I know places like Zimbabwe, I have friends there and they say the trophy hunting brings in, you know, sometimes 90% of their income, but they are seeing the government officials just take a, a large percentage of that. And it's not really trickling down to the people where it needs to go. So I think micro loans and other things to empower the people to make their own money um, that doesn't go through the government is probably a better, a better uh, solution. But again, I'm trying to keep an open mind uh, to keep myself learning. So as you can tell, uh, hair stylists are not essential. Um, so <laughs> they're not essential. So I kind of get this for the monkeys to grow on, uh, climb on. Okay, we'll try to get him over to Drew. There you go. And we'll get that leash and we'll do uh, Tarzan next, Drew. So now we'll see a cousin to the uh, bush baby, another lesser primate. There are Tarzans, there are bush babies, there are uh, lorises, also uh, slow lorises uh, that are all considered pro, uh, prosimians or lesser primates. And then there's subfamilies uh, that go from there. And again, marshmallows are a low calorie, um, 
treat that they get. They eat very healthy food, vegetables, and these special monkey biscuits and all that. And then when they work, um, they get, uh, this is their job, they get some treats. Come on, come on, buddy. You, here you go. And what we try to do is train them to do things they do naturally. We climb, um, this guy likes to do what we call roping where you put a marshmallow up top and then he pulls it all the way down. Can I have that please? Hey, there's no more marshmallow. <laughs> He's obsessed with this one training device. <laughs> go ahead. So let me see if I can get him to let go of the leash and let's do a, a jump for the people. Ready? We'll have him jump. Come on. Oh, you slipped, huh? So these guys, the lemurs are not found on mainland Africa, as most people know. Um, they are found in Madagascar. There are over 20 different species of lemur. This is a ring-tailed lemur. They can live over 20 years. And unlike the uh, bush baby, they do live in troops of about 25. And if you've seen the old movies, uh, they're getting old now, Madagascar movies, where you had King Julian, uh, that is not correct. Uh, lemurs, um, they, uh, there's no king lemurs, only queens. Come on, come on, I got you, come on. I know, you slipped once and now you're nervous. And so the males are lower in the hierarchy. The women are the ones that go into battle and, and make all the rules. And typically each troop is about uh, 25 and they do like a large uh, territory of about 50 plus acres. And they will fight over territorial battles and uh, sometimes male lemurs will battle sometimes, usually over uh, females. So that's fairly common. And you can see he likes the little marshmallow. And they have very big teeth, even though they're herbivores, they need the big teeth to rip through, uh, you know, uh, plants and fruits and, and, and things like that. So they have very big and very sharp teeth. And even though they're very cute, uh, not too many lemurs are this friendly. They're not really an animal to be uh, messed with too much. Madagascar, as far as their um, conservation has come a long way over the last two years, they have a lot of uh, items that they're exporting and things like that, and things are going uh, better. With any society though, as people try to grow, there has to be a proper balance of, you know, uh, habit, you know, saving the habitat and seeing what habitats can be used for farming and growth of product and things like that. So there always has to be checks and balances uh, put in to make sure that the animal's numbers stay strong and survive. All lemurs are listed on the Endangered Act. One of the big reasons is because they are limited to the island of Madagascar. Okay, ready, buddy? Come on, come on, you can do it. You wanna go see Drew? Nice, Drew. Now my hands are all sticky. Okay, we need to spray some, do the monitor next, Drew. All right, we're gonna do a African uh, Savannah monitor. I'm gonna give you a few neat fun facts uh, about these guys. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them uh, verbally or type them in. And I'm hoping the students that watch this later on uh, will be active in asking some questions. Uh, I love answering questions. It's a great way for us all to learn. Uh, I learn a lot by answering questions. Um, but sometimes uh, people come back uh, back and forth with questions and answers and you learn things that, you know, you just learn things. So it's, it's a great way for us all to learn and interact and try to come up with uh, some solutions. Okay. Here we go. This is an African savanna monitor. We're still going over uh, names. What does Levi like to call him? Kronos. Okay, so our staff likes uh, different names. That's Guardians of the Galaxy? I think, I, I think it's Guardians. I can live with that. That was a, that was a pretty funny movie. Uh, so this here is Kronos. He's an African savanna monitor. He has uh, long uh, claws. Over here. And you can see this long tongue that sticks out. It is a cousin to the uh, Komodo dragon and they have very thick skin. In the 90s, I had friends over in Africa, I think it was 1995, and they shot a video of a Savannah monitor fighting a king cobra. And the cobra would bite into the monitor, and the monitor, I have it on VHS somewhere, uh, wouldn't even blink his eye. Eventually, the, the monitor lunged forward, grabbed the cobra by the head, beat it off the ground, and slurped it down like a giant piece of linguine. Um, so they're very tough. And then that was part of a study that showed that uh, certain animals are immune to venom from animals in their own area. 
So this guy here is immune to venom from King Cobra, but if he was to be bitten by like a, uh, you know, North American rattlesnake or anything like that, uh, most likely would not be immune to that venom. Just kind of a, a big animal. Another cool thing, I used to um, do a lot of work with uh, people over at Harvard and they uh, used to use Savannah monitors. I don't know if they still do, I took in a number of their animals uh, years ago from Harvard where they were using um, savanna monitors to study uh, hearing loss in humans because their hearing, even though they have these holes for ears, their hearing is similar uh, to that of people. So these guys were also used in studies um, to help uh, cure hearing loss in mostly infant children, I believe, with that study that was uh, that they were involved in. So just a, a beautiful animal, um, not really hunted uh, too much, uh, not really um, much edible on these guys is some meat in the tail but when people I know in Africa say they really just kind of uh, leave these guys alone they don't really do much with them I do know uh, the pet trade uh, we, there's a legal aspect to it with so many can be imported out of Africa for the pet trade and uh, zoological purposes um, but they're also like with uh, any animal coming out of uh, you know Africa Asia um, South America is a little better on it. There is there is uh, a big um, illegal aspect to that that somehow has to be uh, ma uh, monitored. The other thing that they do with this lizard here is they do what's called captive hatch, where people in Africa uh, get paid by people in other you know American other countries to collect the eggs out of the wild and then they hatch them in what they call captivity and then they sell the the, the babies. That that's very popular. They sell the babies to, um, you know, people in the United States and other countries where they sell them to the pet trade. So one way that people in Africa are making some money is by collecting the monitor eggs or actually also having the monitors in large pits and things out there um, where they breed and um, then, you know, they uh, hatch them out and uh, sell the babies to wholesalers in the pet trade and um you know that's that can be uh that can be a uh, fine it's, it's it's not i don't think it's a terrible uh way to give people money in their pocket and to have people be have access to this beautiful animal so we can learn about it but again anything any program like that has to be monitored on a secondary level to make sure that the numbers in the wild are, are sustainable and so far um the monitor lists are, you know, the numbers are, are very, very good. So, but it is something that always has to be uh, watched carefully. Okay, ready? There you go. I'll just spray that table. Get some of that little poop there off there. We tell them to bathe before these presentations, but you know, sometimes they're still a little poopy. Okay. All right, what do we have next, Drew? Yeah, let's talk about some foxes. Let's do that. The foxes are really beautiful. Um, Drew will bring them out if you want. We have a big fox exhibit um, over here. It's beautiful. I don't know if you want to. It's you. It's really nice. We have three foxes in here. I'll give you a little bit of uh, history. So Chris is going to walk over so you can see. Um, there's Drew. That's Drew's good side. <laughs> and then uh, you see uh, Storm over there on her bed. And then you have Loki right here, her husband. Um, and then you have um, Timon, known as the third wheel. So um, he was the wingman, kind of got these two together, you know? Um, so. This here is Loki, and Loki's an African pale fox. Uh, his uh, uh, wife, Storm, is probably the first or one of the first pale foxes ever to be born in captivity. The pale fox came into captivity accidentally. Um, so um, I think Storm is almost seven, so about you know eight years ago. So there was a group of people that had permits to um, go and collect pale uh, foxes in the wild. And um, what would happen is they got, they went through customs all the way from Africa, all the way into the United States. And when they got back to the research facility, they realized that some of the foxes did not look the same. Then they realized that they had some pale foxes 
that were mixed in with the fennec foxes. Now the pale fox, which I'm holding, actually lives more in the savannas, and then the fennec fox, which is in the exhibit, which hopefully we'll see depending on his mood, actually live in the African uh, Sahara Desert. But there is a map. Chris, could you just show the map here? It'd be easier to explain. This map here is of the fennec fox, and then right here is of the pale fox. And you can see in the southern area here and the northern area here, uh, their habitat overlays. So what happens is this is where this is the region that they were in here where they were collecting the the foxes. So they accidentally got a bunch of these pale foxes. And then uh, they the pale fox was not permitted to for their uh, behavioral studies. So they had permits, they got permits to breed them in captivity so we could study their behavior for a secondary grant in captivity um, because this is at the time probably the least, one of, definitely one of the least studied foxes in the world. And uh, we were asked to take uh, um, Wilkie's uh, wife, Storm, who's in, in there, um, to take her in and to study them in captivity and learn a lot about them. And uh, for me, it's an amazing animal. They're friendly, they're smart. Uh, we've had them litter trained. They're not right now because they're all living together, but when they're living in my house, they're litter trained. Uh, they hide things and remember where they put them. And just as far as being friendly and just awesome, um, yeah, they're, they're really incredible little foxes. You can see this guy here won't even be one till June and look at how he's sitting and just behaving. Um, uh, but we've all been nipped by him a few times, but nothing terrible really. But um, obviously anything can bite. The that's the upside. The downside is over the last few years, a few importers, um, you know, have just have gotten permits to import these in large numbers now into the United States and Europe and other countries where they're starting to flood the the pet market. And I think that is bad. Um, it's not really, from what I can tell from people I talk to in Africa, there's no significant money going into the pockets of the people over there. It's more the people over here that have other means to make money that are making all the money. And whenever you start flooding the pet trade with a certain animal, um, typically you find the numbers decline at such an, a fast rate that um, it catches people off guard. Um, at least that's how it's portrayed and you can find the species in trouble. So I am opposed at this time to importing these out of the wild. A small numbers maybe, um, you know, so they can have babies born in captivity as he was, so people can learn about the animal. And then I find having people uh, pet the animal when it's possible again and, and just get up close does uh, help uh, the awareness to conservation, help people get more involved. So we have to be careful with conservation. We live here in the United States. And I know we're in a tough time right now, but this is still better than a lot, large part of the world lives every day. So we have to be careful that we don't, you know, try to uh, stop all their means of, of making money. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, animals being imported literally by the tens of thousands for the pet trade. These animals come in, they're a little bit older because of the laws. People uh, have, you know, are buying the three, four, five, six months old. They're not really uh, very tame uh, the way this one would be. And even though they're beautiful, kind animals, um, I think, you know, getting them imported out of the wild in mass quantities and trying to make pets out of them uh, is a mistake. I think animals that are pets in captivity in the day and age that we live in should be, in fact, born in captivity if, if possible. Um, and it's certainly possible with this species. Okay, something happened to the TV up there, Chris. Oh, okay, so this is a Loki, a little African pale fox. You can see the ears aren't too big and they do not have um, fur, too much fur really on the bottom of the feet because where they live in the savannas, it's not as hot as the Sahara Desert. So we're gonna see, uh, if Timon will let me pick him up. Sometimes he's very cranky during the day. But let me see if I can get him. Okay. Here you go, bud. Come on, you're fine. You're fine. This is Timon, he is a fennec fox and he's from the African Sahara Desert. And you can see a few features right away, larger ears. They actually have the largest 
uh, ear to head ratio of any fox even larger. This is ratio than the bat-eared fox. So the bat-eared fox's ears are larger, uh, but not the head to ear ratio. Then you can see inside the ears, very attractive feature. It's fur in the ears. I know on people, it's kind of creepy, right? A little bit, be honest. Um, but on the fennec fox, where they live in the desert and there are sandstorms, what happens when the sandstorms kick up, they fold their ears flat like that. The fur is designed to keep the sand from blowing into their ear canal. Then they take their bushy tail and they wrap it around their face and huddle down uh, for protection. You also notice the amount of fur uh, on the bottom of the feet. And that will work uh, at least two, two different ways. One is to keep their feet from getting burned. Um, even though they are primarily nocturnal, that sometimes they are forced out of their den during the day. Actually, I have a video shot in the 90s from friends of mine of a monitor lizard like you just saw, um, actually forcing a, a small fennec fox out of its den during the day and taking off. So um, if they have to go on the desert sand during the day when it's hot, the fur will keep them from getting burnt. But other than that, it also helps them um, grip onto the sand. If you ever tried to, if you ever ran on bare feet on a hard surface, uh, grass or whatever, you run at one speed. And then if you run in soft sand and bare feet, you're actually your time is much slower um, because you're sinking into the sand, you don't grip as well. Uh, so this uh, fur helps them grip onto the sand, them only weighing from uh, two to five pounds, and five pounds would be extremely heavy. Usually it's only three or four pounds. Um, and again, uh, there's a little variation size from male to female. Um, and this guy here is, is a boy. So being lightweight and having the fur on their feet helps them skip across the sand and run at a pretty good clip to evade uh, predators. An important note about the fennec fox is they um, are monogamous, so they will uh, marry and mate for life. And the reason they were being imported out of the wild to study them was fennec foxes, along with a lot of the animals, uh, will eat their, uh, their young. Um, I know why they do it, that they wanted to find out why they do it in captivity and compare it to why they do it in the wild. Again, I have answers for them, um, but not everybody loves the answer. But in the wild, we'll just talk about that for today. In the wild, they eat their young to save their species. It sounds uh, contradictory, but let me explain. So if a mother fox is in her uh, den and she'll have you know two to four little uh, uh, kits in there, little pups, and then a predator comes that the male fox, he, he's outside the den, the mother doesn't eat much during this time when she's nursing the baby, she eats very little. The male fox, if he can ward off the predator, will uh, let his wife know with a certain call, hey, I'm gonna be fighting, but everything's fine, chase the predator away. If he cannot defeat the predator and he sees a larger animal coming that, you know, maybe a big sand cat or something that is a pretty tough uh, um, animal, then he will call to his wife and that, that call will be um, essentially, if possible, eat the children and let's get out of here. So she's hungry, she's not eating much. If her children are small enough, she'll consume some of her children. Um, so she has energy and then they run off together and then they uh, breed again and have babies. It sounds terrible, but if they didn't do that, that and, and the mother uh, and father were just killed by the predator, then the numbers would obviously uh, disappear completely. So it sounds terrible, but it is, that's uh, you know how they survive. Um, <coughs> in captivity, I have a theory. It's not popular, but I want to share it with you because I'm sure you're all smart people out there. In captivity, is if you're going to work with an animal for programs, uh, is very good to work with at a very young age. So what happens is um, a lot of times the babies are taken from the mother very young. So educators and stuff like myself can work with them from a young age and, um, and bond with them and get them friendly. We typically, our, our company typically takes the ones that um, did not bond with the mother and the mother was not uh, feeding. Um, a theory that I have that I work with another group, um, I can't mention the name because I said I can't. Um, our studies kind of point towards the fact that if you, for generation after generation, if you take babies from a mother as soon as she gives birth, that um, they, after so many generations, they kind of don't know how to be mothers. So if you have, say, five or six generations and of mothers that give birth, and the second their birth, the babies are taken from them, right? And then, you know, you try, you know, several generations later, you try to leave the babies and have the mother nurse them. The mother, it, they seem to have been bred out of them how to uh, be just naturally be a mother. And it doesn't hold true with everyone, but it does seem to have 
uh, there does seem to be some truth to that. So it's something that we're looking into to try to come up with a good way that educators can work with baby animals and bond for education. And at the same time, the mothers know how to be mothers. So I have some simple solutions. It's just trying to get trying to get someone to listen to me. It's just not easy, you know? Um, so this is Timon. He's behaving very well because he's very sleepy. He was very vocal late last night. Oh, okay. Why don't you go back to bed? There you go, buddy. Right for the toy. We'll have to belly scotch him later. That's really what he wants. All right. So let's do uh, one more. If everybody can hold on for one more. We're going to go into here, into our Africa, African Serval exhibit. He also has an outside exhibit. We just have him inside right now. Uh, so he'd be here for filming purposes. And then we'll let him out. Put that walk there. So don't lose it. Hey, Laz. So this room that we're in at used to be my bedroom. And Laz used to sleep in here. Dang, right in. So the African servals are very uh, vocal animals. They also found the African savannas. This one uses his litter box and it was cleaned uh, not too long ago and it's already full of pee, so we'll clean it again. Um, this is his uh, sofa. He likes the sofa. He likes his blankets up here. Sometimes he knocks them on the ground. And uh, we have this. So when we uh, have to give him his shots and clean his ears and all that, we come in and we sit down and then it's comfortable and then we can, you know, uh, trim nails and clean ears and give him uh, their, their yearly shots. This here is his uh, kennel and he has, uh, he likes to use it as his cave and you can see there if Chris can focus in on his uh, breakfast, his, uh, fresh raw chicken. And then you can see his bowl here. He has uh, some oats and oil. So we use uh, rolled oats and oil and raw chicken is most of his diet. Once in a while, he will get a um, high quality can of cat food that helps soften their stool. And I don't know if you can see uh, Eugene over there, our emu uh, friend in the background. So his exhibit's out back. And whenever he sees people, they come to window because we um the african serval in here uh laz he's a lot of cats a lot of animals like to have you know private little areas that they go in and um you know we don't travel him to the vet the vet veterinarian actually comes here because he doesn't like to travel uh, but it's good for them to be comfortable going in and out of kennels just in case we did have to travel him or um you know take him out of this exhibit to clean it or or, or whatever um and maybe he'll come out and say hi to me. So some cats you can approach. The serval really likes to approach you. It's one of the faster cats. I have friends that have clocked them at over 40 miles an hour. Only the caracal and the cheetah really have been clocked uh, faster than that. I have another friend that says their serval hit over 50 miles an hour. So it's very possible, I think. And they do have the highest vertical jump of any feline, they can jump over 10 feet straight up, which is pretty amazing. And you can see they have smaller paws, uh, it helps them, uh, you know, uh, uh, run and, and, and jump. They don't need the large paws to walk on the snow because they live in Africa, in the savannas. Uh, they are a cat that will go into water, so they'll go into water and get frogs and fish. Um, not so much like the tiger, where they'll actually spend a long period of time in there, but they will go in and uh, smack fish and frogs around and uh, eat them. When we lived here, my younger daughters would be in the bathtub when he was just a little kitten and he'd run out and jump in the bathtub. He was much smaller and, and so were they. So there was no harm done. And one there. And cat affection and a sign that they're comfortable with you. And there's a lot of little sounds uh, from the animals that we have here for the program that he's uh, you know, very aware of. You can see the markings in the back of his ears. A lot of researchers believe that those ear, ear markings in the ears are to trick predators to think that, um, that these are eyes. So when a predator is sneaking up behind him and the serval has his ears up, that these look like eyes causing the predator to expose himself to the front. Um, I don't know, it, a lot of people uh, teach that and a lot of studies say it's possible. The only issue I have with that personally is that his, his hearing 
is so uh, acute and the sense of smell is so strong that I think by the time a predator is really focusing on the ear, it's just a little common sense thing I have um, that the cerebral will probably uh, be aware that something's in the area. Um, if not right away, very soon after. And then he would not sit still and wait for the predator to come around the front. He would take off to safety. Um, one of the um, top, top predators of this animal is another cat, the cheetah. So the cheetah is a bigger, faster, stronger cat, and the cheetah regularly hunts African servals. Um, anything that has such a beautiful coat like this, we do have to be aware that there is um, a whole um, division, uh, however you want to put it, of, of poaching, that uh, poaching is not just for meat or just for pet trade, but also is for um, fur. So there are servals and other cats. There is a lot of evidence to show that they're still being poached uh, for their fur. This is also the cat that people um, call uh, savannah cats. This is a purebred African serval, but what people do is they breed domestic cats to the serval and they label them as savannas. Uh, it has become its own breed and they have uh, things from F1. You know, I've seen things, I don't know how they have cats this old all the way to F12. Uh, F1 to F5 uh, or 6 are the most common ones that you see and it's just the closer, like an F1 has uh, over 50% serval in it. And as you go to F2 and, and on, it just means that uh, they have less wild uh, serval in it and more domestic cat. It gets to the point where some of the Savannah cats for sale uh, like only have uh, the bloodline of a great, great, great grandparent in it and not actually, you know, a first generation serval like this guy. So he's friendly, uh, but again, we, he, he has to approach us. We don't make him do anything. Cats have that kind of personality. So uh, we'll conclude our program, I think, with the African serval. And uh, I hope people enjoyed it. I know you can't be right here touching it, but um, hopefully this whole thing will be lifted sooner than later and we can come visit you guys or you can come and visit us. And I'm going to open up his window. So see if he wants to go outside the sun is out it's a beautiful day oh there he goes here's a big outdoor play area with shelves and everything so all right so i know a lot of people will be watching this so hopefully a lot of people will be watching this after the fact feel free to email any questions uh for us and if there's animals that you'd like to see in the upcoming weeks, you can also make suggestions. If we have them, we'll cover them for you. Um, great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.